And uh, my name is Irfan Mustafa. I'm one of the executive members of Sasayat Foundation London. Uh, on behalf of the Sasayat Foundation, I welcome you here. Uh, we are doing this program to just pay tribute to two legends. One of them is uh, Professor Mushir Hassan and the other is Saki Farooq Isaab. Can I just request uh, Dr. Hilal Farid to come and take to the start of the program. Dr. Hilal Farid. Thank you, Irfan sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this program has two parts. And the first part of the program uh, is to celebrate the life of Professor Mushirul Hassan, who, besides being a prominent historian, was not only a friend and well wisher of this organization, but also a great supporter of all that the organization stands for. Uh, he, in fact, when we were forming this organization in the very beginning, he said to us that uh, if you are doing something like this, I will be coming every year to take part. And he did come in two of our functions, and in one of the functions, uh, Professor Robinson was uh, there with him, and we had an excellent uh, uh, discussion. Unfortunately, he's not, he's, he's left this uh, uh, world and now we are remembering him. We are fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of experts to facilitate his remembrance uh, and we are honored that Professor Francis Robinson has agreed to chair this session. I invite him to occupy his seat on this stage please. We all know Professor Robinson very well, but I have to follow the tradition and uh, do a bit of introduction to this audience. Um, uh, professor Robinson has been a professor at the Royal Holloway University at London, Washington University and Oxford University. He has also served as president of the Royal Asiatic Society. Professor Robinson was awarded CBE in 2006 for his services to higher education and his research into the history of Islam. He is well known to this audience, as I said earlier. Professor Robinson had known Mushirul Hassan uh, Sahib since 1968. Is that correct? Uh, and we have had the honor of having both Professor Robinson and Professor Mushirul Hassan Sahib together uh, uh, as I said before, uh, particularly when we were celebrating uh, the um, uh, Sir Sayed's uh, annual celebrations in 2013. Thank you, Professor, for being here. Now, I uh, now invite our next uh, distinguished guest, and that is uh, Professor Iftikhar Malik. Uh, uh, Professor Malik, would you please come and take a seat to the left of uh, professor Malik is a professor and senior lecturer in history at Bath Spa University College and a member of the editorial board of Contemporary South Asia. He is the author of Islam and Modernity. Uh, professor Iftikhar Malik is the fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He teaches modern history at Bath, as I said and is an MCR at Wolfson College, Oxford, with doctoral and postdoctoral training at Michigan State, Columbia, and UC Berkeley. He has published 18 books and several papers on historical subjects. Since 9-11, he has offered 870 interviews to the print, audio, and visual media on a wide variety of subjects. So, Professor Webb. And our next guest is uh, Dr. Farsana Sheikh, and we are honored that you are here, and I think it's the first time you two are coming to. Please come to the stage, to the right of Professor Robinson, please. <laughs> Dr. Sheikh holds a PhD from Columbia University in New York, 
She has held a number of academic teaching positions in the UK, Europe, and the United States, and been appointed to senior research fellowships at the University of Cambridge and the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton and Paris. Dr. Sheikh is a frequent media commentator on South Asia and is a regular speaker at conferences and meetings in the UK and abroad. She is an associate fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London and the author of Community and Consensus in Islam. Thank you for that. Now I will leave the stage and hand over uh, to Professor Robinson who is chairing this, uh, this session. Thank you very much. My duty today is simple. Um, we're going to spend 15 minutes each uh, uh, talking about Bushir al Hassan uh, in, from our various points of view. Uh, I will round up at the end. So let us begin with Dr. Sheff. Thank you. Not being sufficiently confronted, 
and which he feared may even have found a home within the hallowed confines of his own discipline. This is not to say that Mushir ever gave up the struggle to be heard. Mushir was nothing if not a fighter. But it is to say that in his final years, he had grown disillusioned and openly questioned if, like Daki Mir, he too had been left speaking a tongue they do not understand. The grounds for such pessimism, I believe, were unwarranted. Mushir's influence on his peers, on his peers and successive generations of historians was nothing less than groundbreaking. Through his early meticulously researched work, which shone a spotlight on the thinking of nationalist Muslims in late colonial India, who had chosen to stand against the idea of Pakistan, Mushir opened the way for a much needed alternative perspective into Muslim engagement with the Indian nationalist movement. Its implications for a pluralistic Indian Republic and the future of arguably its most vulnerable minority, India's Muslims, were carefully developed in the vast corpus of work he produced in his lifetime. With the kind of encyclopedic reach over Indian arts, literature and language, especially Urdu, that was once the preserve of such giants of Indo-Muslim history as Muhammad Mujib and Aziz Ahmed, Mushir took on an exceptional challenge. It involved nothing less than acknowledging the processes of mutual attraction and repulsion that went into the construction of India's composite culture, while remaining absolutely clear-eyed about the inherent strengths and energy that flowed from this amalgamation of different religions, different cultures, and schools of thought. At the heart of this enterprise lay Mushir's passionate commitment to articulate a vision of Islam, or as he put it, the many different kinds of Islam that favored living in harmony with other faiths and that prepared Muslims to take their place as the proud inheritors of Indian civilization. In this, Mushir carried forth a remarkable intellectual tradition, nurtured by some of India's most distinguished Muslims, such as Maulana Abul Kalam Azad and M. A. Ansari, who offered what Mushir hailed as an alternative to communitarian politics. Mushir's own contribution to that tradition resonated, and indeed continues to resonate powerfully today, not only among his scholarly peers, Peers, but also among the many men and women in public life in India who look to this historical work to sustain their commitment to Indian pluralism and the defense of India's secular constitution. My own encounter with Mushir's work was complex but undeniably rich in its rewards. There was much that separated us not least the role we reserved for the recognizably Islamic discourse in shaping a distinct Muslim identity in India that would later hasten the course of Muslim separatism and the demand for Pakistan. When my book, Community and Consensus in Islam, was first published in 1989, there were few, if any, serious takers of my argument, aside from Francis, to whom I remain grateful. My claim that it made little sense to understand the trajectory of Muslim politics in late colonial India without any meaningful reference to Islamic paradigms was stoutly resisted, both in India, where it evoked uncomfortable questions of political belonging sparked by partition, as well as in Pakistan, where it was seen to furnish grounds for an Islamic state. Among my many critics was Mushir, who singled out for attention what he judged to be my overemphasis on the language of normative Islam favored by elite Muslims, 
at the expense of what he called lived Islam of ordinary Muslims, which he maintained was more multifaceted than the, quote, essentialist reading of Islam upon which I had depended to shore up my argument. Although I did not accept Mushir's criticisms as valid for reasons which I have aired elsewhere publicly on numerous occasions, they were well judged. More importantly, they acted as a spur to take this vital debate forward and prize open questions hitherto obscured by the divisive rhetoric of partition about the power of a complex Islamically informed discourse to shape, direct and sometimes constrain the conduct of Indo-Muslim politics. In the second edition of my book, published in 2012, to which Bashir contributed a thoughtful and gracious foreword, we both returned to these themes, wiser, I think, and more attentive to each other's concerns. In one of my last conversations around the subject with Bashir some years back, he suggested, not at all flippantly, that we should abandon the idea of writing a single history of Indian nationalism. Instead, he proposed, we should concentrate on writing two histories of nationalism. One, a history of its beginning, its development and culmination. The other, a history of trial and error resulting in condition. <coughs> For no reading, he claimed, is correct. So let history decide. For us Indian and Pakistani historians, Mushir's message was unambiguous. Let us stop this constant scratching of the wound. Let us instead focus on respecting rather than denying the past. Doing so, I believe, would be our greatest tribute to this most exceptional of historians. Thank you. Society uh, for organizing uh, this special session to pay our tribute uh, to these uh, two uh, uh, literary personalities that we lost uh, last year, and uh, they were joints in their own respective fields. And since uh, Dr. Sheikh started her presentation with uh, an Urdu verse. I think I'll use a Persian verse, which is from today's century, Allah my God. Saul ha dar kaaba ho put khani bi nalad hayat. Saul ha dar kaaba ho put khani bi nalad hayat. Those of us be ishti yakda na ira zawiyat baro. So we, 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 the people like these are not a kind of usual phenomenon. And of course we miss them. I've heard uh, uh, Saki Faruqi several times in London in Bushairas, sitting in the van and in Oxford. And he was man of vision, he was man of energy, and he was an impressive poet. And before him we lost two other very famous uh, poets uh, who uh, or uh, the institutions unto themselves. Akbar Hyderabad, uh, who lived in Oxford and he used to meet him very often. And another poet that we lost a couple of years ago, Khalid Yusuf, uh, who also lived in uh, Oxford. So we do miss these people because they carried on that tradition of uh, literary excellence uh, that they brought with them from the subcontinent. Um, my presentation, a um, few things about uh, Professor Bushir al Hassan and then a little bit about uh, Aligarh and historiography. I read Professor Bashir al Hassan all the way from the 70s and 80s and 90s, I mean, during my student days, during my days as a researcher and as a teacher. 
I caught up with him in the 1990s. We used to have long sittings in Oxford when he was on a visiting fellowship and he gave lectures at St. Anthony's and then Ashwari. And then I caught up with him uh, at Jam Emilia where he was the Vice Chancellor and um, then at Aliga. And then I heard about this very sad uh, accident that he encountered and then last year he passed away. Um, he was definitely, as Dr. Sheikh was saying, a very eminent historian and he has left quite a number of students. And like um, uh, Saki Saab, he would always live through his words, the printed words. Um, he started from Calcutta. His father was an historian. Some of you know more about it than me, but I thought in case people wanted to know more about Professor Mushir Lassan, his father was a great historian. And then he came to Aligarh and he studied at Aligarh. And from Aligarh he went to teach in a college in Delhi. And from Delhi he came to Cambridge and within three years he completed his PhD, his DPhil. And he knew what he wanted to do at Cambridge and in the, you know, went back and he started teaching at uh, John Emilia and uh, later on he became the Vice Chancellor of John Emilia. And he, he was a wonderful manager as well, other than being an eminent historian. He introduced lots of new disciplines and study centers at John Emilia. And you know the history of John Emilia all the way from the First World War onwards is, is, as a great institution owes its eminence to people like Professor Muhammad Mujib and of course uh, uh, Shirul Hassan, uh, Third World Institute of Third World Studies and the uh, Center for the Lead Studies and why he was managing this university and expanding it you know in every sense of the word through building new buildings and introducing new subjects and putting it on the global academic map he was also writing, reading, publishing, organizing seminars, and I've been always impressed by his untiring energy and the historical research that he has produced, multi volumes. His fields were generally, as um, Dr. Sheikh was saying, partition of India, communalism, um, state of uh, Muslim communities in India after partition. And after, in the 1990s, Mushir was deeply worried about India and of course about Pakistan, the way politics was being redefined, especially after Ayodhya 1992. And, uh, you know, that, that he, he felt that kind of secular politics that he always stood for, you know, based on coexistence amongst the plural communities of South Asia, was under threat. And I think this deeply worried him. And when we would have this, you know, meetings and informal sessions in Oxford, we would talk about it. And um, so, so Michel um, wrote about these subjects. He also wrote about uh, uh, prominent Indian Muslim activists and historians that you generally don't get to know in Pakistan. I mean, he wrote books on uh, Maulana Azad. He wrote on Mustafa Ansari. He wrote about Zakaula, one of the early Muslim historians. So his, his work was, um, you know, in those areas which, were, which had remained sort of unresearched, uninvestigated for a long time. He was also a symbol of Aliga, because when I visited Aliga and I went around, I was really impressed by how this whole project came into being. I mean, two years ago, we had the 200th centenary of Sayyid Ahmad Khan. But Sir Sayyid Khan came here in 1869 and he lived in a couple of houses in Bloomsbury. I visited those places and uh, how he used to work at the British Museum Library, the reading room, the main reading room, which brought Charles Dickens and uh, Charles Darwin and uh, Karl Marx and Sir Sayyid, all these guys in the mid 19th century. Though Sir Sayyid was here in 1869 and he was deemed a biography of, uh, of the Prophet. Sir Sayyid also went to uh, Bristol. I mean, of course, he went to Cambridge and Oxford, and this is how he thought of, you know, modeling his future academic institution, which in 1920 became Aligarh University. He also went to Bristol, like Raja Ram Mohan Rai. Not many people know, because Raja Ram Mohan Rai has, uh, you know, passed away in, um, in, in Bristol. He used to visit uh, Bristol quite often. But anyway, yes, 
when I was in Leningrad, I was so impressed by, by the vision that Cecil carried. Even before 1857, Cecil was so historical minded, he published his book, Asaro Sanabdin, which is about the monuments of his uh, Delhi, which was sadly destroyed in 1857-1858. He um, edited and published a uh, novel for Zulu Akbari. And when the history department was started, I mean, in 1920, I think, or something, the first chairperson of history department at Aligarh was K.M. Panikar. And the first book which was published in Aligarh history was about Ashoka. So Sir Sayyid was not a communalist. Sir Sayyid's own collections that I personally saw, and uh, they are kept in the, in the founder's building in Aligarh. They celebrate India's past, India's very rich past, Jain past, Buddhist past, Hindu past. So some people who sadly thought that Sir Sayyid was you know, only thinking of uh, Muslims of India. And in Pakistan, I know he has been appropriated in a very sort of injudicious way for Pakistan movement. Sir Sayyid was a very broad-minded person. So in those kind of, that kind of environment, Mushir al-Hassan grew up and Mushir al-Hassan studied. And Aligarh produced some of those eminent historians we, we know about, and Professor Habib, for example, and now Professor Defon Habib. So Aligarh has made quite a bit of inter contribution in historical scholarship, and this is where I think people like Mushir al Hassan, you know, sort of uh, discovered themselves. Now, about South Asian history, we'll come back to it, uh, you know, because we'll have a panel discussion, and you will have your questions, and we'll have Debate. I personally feel that um, study of Islam in South Asia has come up largely due to the efforts of people like Mushir al -Hassan. because after partition, sadly, this scholarship, especially of Islam in South Asia, was also partitioned. And in Pakistan, it became very, very exclusive. And that element of inclusivity that Aligarh and some other universities in India before partition tried to tried to promote was centered, and I think it became very difficult to talk about and write about, you know, Islam in a very plural sense. Mushir's views on Islam and India were, what I gathered from his writings and my discussion with him, that they were mutually inclusive, they were not exclusive. Islam helped India discover itself, like all other cultural, intellectual, historical, theological traditions. Same way India, you know, enriched Islamic experience in South Asia. I remember on Wednesdays when I was at St. Anthony's, every Wednesday we would have tea uh, with Albert Hurani, the great scholar of uh, you know, the Middle East. And uh, Albert Hurani's tea sessions, generally Albert would say that 18th century was not a century of decline of Islamic studies. It was the century of Indian Islam. So, so, so my feeling is that Mushir was one of those pioneers who felt that Islam should be discovered or Islam should be studied in reference to the Indian plurality, which is a very historical reality. And um, this, this is where I think that Mushir made a major, major, you know, sort of contribution. Uh, he did worry about Indian Muslims and, uh, you know, how partition had affected them and uh, same way he did worry about Pakistan, that how, you know, this Indian Islam. Uh, I don't think he really believed that partition of India was really partition of Muslims. But the way things happened, it definitely affected not only the Muslims of South Asia, but also the studies of uh, Muslim history. Uh, in that part of the world. Mushir also <laughs> worked as the head of the archives, and I think that contribution still needs to be uh, acknowledged. And um, uh, how, I mean, I don't know how he found this much energy to do so many things as a teacher, as a writer, as an organizer of seminar, as a head, as a vice chancellor. So, all these personalities that Mushir al Hassan combined in his person makes him. Uh, into a role model, and um, I think uh, we would always miss him. And 
other than his creativity, other than his originality, something that really uh, impresses me about him is that he was a very bold man. He had tough times in the 1990s, especially when he gave his interview about uh, the satanic verses. But uh, this man stood for his views, he never compromised, he was a very courageous man, and he had a great sense of humor. So while sitting here together, you know, paying our tribute to his scholarship, we do remember him as a wonderful, courageous, and warm personality. Wow. Thank you very much. Wow. I've been asked to talk, at least begin my words, with some words about my association with Professor Moshir Hassan. Uh, and as Dr. Hadid said earlier, I met him in, 19, in 1968, so we'd actually known each other for over 50 years. Um, and in fact, his father sent, when Mushir was a delegate, a student, sent uh, to meet me in Delhi. And as a result of that meeting, uh, I was then responsible for introducing Mushir to my Cambridge College, Trinity, uh, where he came to be supervised uh, by Dr. Anil Seal. Now, in fact, he and Anil didn't get on very well. Uh, Moshir was far too much his own man to be pushed this way and that by the dynamic of Dr. Seal. And so, quite quickly, uh, Moshir turned his affections, I'm not sure affections is the right word, he looked for support from Professor Eric Stokes, uh, another leading uh, historian of South Asia uh, in Cambridge. And Eric Stokes was a marvellous supporter of Mushia, and Mushia in turn repaid that support. This was very much the kind of gesture you would expect from Mushia. In after uh, Professor Eric Stokes' early death, putting together a memorial body uh, in memory of Eric Stokes. My association with Moshe continued. I would see him almost every year. As whenever I went to Delhi, I would stay with him and Zoya. And whenever he came to England, uh, certainly initially, he would stay with us. And indeed, early on, his father would stay with us as well. So I can claim a very long association with Moshe, which extends not just to Moshe, but also to his older brother, Najmul, uh, who was killed on during the Iran-Iraq war, which he was covering for Reuters, uh, and also very much to his father. And personally, I owe a great deal to his father, who was enormously helpful to me when I first went to India in 1967-68. Now, to my mind, so over the past day or so, I've been thinking about all Moshe's production and all his works uh, and how they come together. And this has led me to thinking that one of the first things one needs in order to understand Shira is to get some sense of the influence of his father. Uh, his father uh, came from Mohammedpur in, uh, in Bairanki, just outside Lucknow. His father's father worked, uh, was one of the management team that managed the Mehmudabad estate, uh, which many of you will know is the largest Muslim estate uh, in India. And so his father was very much part of that lively world in the Kastanas around Lucknow, which also fostered the Progressive Writers Association, the Progressive Writers Movement. And he became uh, almost a Marxist, certainly a socialist. Now, Mushir's father was a keen historian. He was actually the founder of the history department at Jamia Mele Islamia. 
and his, all his work was really done on aspects of Muslim power in India. So he studied, for instance, uh, Tipu Sultan. He wrote a biography of the Mughal Emperor uh, Babu. Uh, he studied, for instance, Kashmir under the Sultans. So there was this continuing concern with, if you like, Muslim power and what one might call, actually, the location of the Sharif classes, uh, the Muslim Sharif classes in India. And there was a part of Mushira, although he actually, part of him would hate me for saying so, uh, that was immensely proud of the Kaspar world, immensely proud of this world in which the descendants of the old Mughal service classes had both sustained and developed Mughal culture under colonial rule. There are three of his works in which you can see this very clearly. One is more about the way in which the Mongol service classes sustained uh, themselves, <coughs> and that's in a book called A Moral Reckoning. The second is in his book From Pluralism to Separatism, which is about the Kaspars of Ahmad. And very importantly, this book is actually dedicated to his father, who describes to my father, who was a true Kaspati. And then, of course, there is um, another book which comes very much out of this world, His Wit and Wisdom in Northern India, which deals with the exciting writing of Willard Ali Bambok, uh, but also uh, the poetry and the cartoons of Howard Crunch. So, Ushir, in one sense, was very proud of the way in which Muslim culture or Islamic culture in Northern India had been sustained and developed in this Kastati environment. Now, he would have seen two great products of that process. One in the creation of Aligarh, Aligarh Muslim University, but also very particularly in the creation of the Jamia Milia Islamia. And as most of you will know, for most of his life, Moshia was involved with the Jamia, the National Muslim University. Quite a lot of his work, his writing, was actually involved with those who built up the university. With his early work on Mawlana Muhammad Ali. Although I do think that uh, Bushi was a little doubtful about what Muhammad Ali's politics might have been and he continued to live through the 1930s, but he was safe up until 1930. Um, his work on that Dr. Ansari, his biographies of Gandhi and the National Muslim University of the Jamia would never actually have survived without funding support from Gandhi. And of course, his work on that and Nehru was particularly important to the continuing existence and development of the Jamia after independence. Now, Mushir himself actually wrote a fine history of the Jamia in Islamia, called Partners in Freedom. Um, <coughs> and it's a tremendous expression, really, of if you like, the nationalist Muslim ideal. He was very proud of the traditions which had been fostered to begin with by Muhammad Ali and Dr. Ansari, but subsequently by Professor Muhammad Mujib, who became Vice Chancellor in the 1950s, by Zakir Hussain, who went to the Vice Chancellorship of Jamia become Vice President of India, uh, and also by his uh, particular patron, Willard, I'm sorry, um, sorry, Kidwai, I can only remember the man's father's name at the moment, uh, Amar Jamal, 
Al-Majamal Kipri, who brought him to uh, Jamia and fostered his early career. Um, it was wholly appropriate as the person who'd probably done more than anyone else to sustain the narrative of Muslim, Indian Muslim contribution uh, to Indian nationalism and who refused to allow it to be dominated or smothered by the story of Muslim separatism. It was most appropriate that he should have become Vice-Chancellor of the Germany. And not only was he Vice-Chancellor, he was also the great building Vice-Chancellor. Buildings were going up almost every month while Mujia was Vice-Chancellor. Um, and he played a major role, along with others, in turning the Jamia into one of India's great central universities. That could only have been done with considerable effort and political will. And so it's wholly fitting that Mushia is now buried at the Jamia alongside Zakir Hussain and others who have done so much for the Indian Muslims. So I put to you two great contributions, one in the writing the story and sustaining the story of Indian Muslims in South Asia in often quite difficult circumstances and secondly, building up this great nationalist institution with its very distinctive values. Now, Mushia was marked by courtesy, uh, humor, as we've been told, friendship, he had the arts of friendship, and by liberal views distinctly liberal views. And if Dikarsan has just mentioned the courageous line he took over uh, the satanic verses. He didn't, he said, he didn't approve of the book, but he would defend to the end uh, the right of people to publish their book. And of course he got beaten up for speaking out so forcefully. Of course, that underlines another characteristic, his courage. As a historian, as I think uh, Iftikhar Saab indicated, he belonged to no faction. He wasn't a Marxist. Uh, he wasn't a subaltern. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't uh, formed by the Cambridge School. If he was anything, he was a Congress nationalist. A Congress nationalist who was determined that the role of Indian Muslims in achieving independence in India should be as fully understood as possible. And that, to my mind, is his greatest legacy. Thank
uh, it was really painful for me to write about Professor Mushiru Masad because I had long, long association with him and uh, um, I thought that Urdu is the best language that I could describe my feelings. So, <clears throat> I'm going to read it in Urdu. हमारे दोस्त इरफान मुस्तफा साहब का फोन मुझे 9 दिसंबर की रात को साढ़े ग्यारह बजे आया कि मुशीर साहब नहीं रहे मैं जानता था कि वो अनिल हैं इस वक्त दिल्ली में सुबह के पाँच बजे होंगे और वहाँ तारीख 10 दिसंबर नहीं होगी इनके इंतकाल का खौफ तो मुझे पिछले चार बरस से था जब से वो ट्रैफिक हादसे का शिकार हुए थे अब एक पूरा दौर तमाम हो गया था मेरी आंखों के सामने वही फिल्म चलने लगी जिसे मैंने अपने आप से भी पर्दे में रखा हुआ था बेख्तियार एक गहरी हिचकी आई और मैं अपना जब्त खो बैठा हर घर में एक ऐसा कोना होता है जहां किसी को छुपकर रोना होता है मैं रोया भी और तड़पा भी आज तीसरा दिन है मुझे अभी तक सब्रो करार नहीं आ रहा है दोस्तों के फोन ताजियत के लिए आ रहे हैं और मैं खुद भी हिम्मत नहीं पा रहा हूँ कि किसी को फ़ोन करूँ हती कि प्रोफेसर मुशीर हसन की बीवी जोया आसन को भी प्रोफेसर मुशीर हसन साहब से मेरी मुलाकात को एक चौथाई सदी पहले यही लंदन में हुई थी हमारे एक अजीज़ दोस्त डॉक्टर नजरुल इस्लाम बोस ये सुभाष चंद्र बोस के भतीजे थे उन्होंने लंदन में एक बहुत बड़ा सेमिनार करवाया जिसमें मुशीर हसन साहब को बतौर ख़ास हिंदुस्तान की आज़ादी और क़्याम पाकिस्तान पर गुफ्तु करने के लिए बुलाया गया मुझसे कहा गया कि वो चंद रोज आपके यहाँ क़्याम करेंगे मैं ही थ्रो से लेकर इन्हें अपने यहाँ चला आया रास्ते में तफसीली बातें होती रहीं मैं इनसे तरह तरह के सवाल पूछता रहा जवाब में उनका अंदाज़ गुफ्तु मुझे बेहद पसंद आया दलील से बात करते थे मुताला बेहद वसी था आज़ादी के बाद उन्नीस में वो पैदा हुए थे इनके वाल प्रोफेसर मुजीबुल हसन भी मॉडरक थे और बेहद पढ़े लिखे आदमी थे उन, उन्होंने भी जाम मिलिया इस्लामिया में पढ़ाया था यहाँ एक इमारत उनके नाम से मंसूब है इसके बाद मुशीर साहब जब भी लंदन आते ख्वा चंद दिनों के लिए ही क्यों ना हो वो मेरे लिए वक्त निकालते इरफान मुस्तफ़ा के साथ में इनके लेक्चर और सेमिनार वगैरह में भी जाया करता था किंग्स कॉलेज और ब्रिटिश लाइब्रेरी इनकी महबूब जगह थी मकामी प्रोफेसर इन्हें हैरत से देखते थे कि कैसी मुदल गुफ्तु करते हैं और किसी भी सवाल का जवाब बगैर रेफरेंस के नहीं देते उनका हाफजा बिला का था हिंदुस्तान और वस्त एशिया की तबारीख अलग यूरोपी तारीख पर भी उन्हें अबूर था मुझे और इरफान को साथ रखते और हम इनसे सीखने की कोशिश किया करते थे मरहूम से मेरा तारफ उस वक्त तो इतना पुराना नहीं था लेकिन जैसा कुछ लोगों के लिए महसूस होता है कि हम मिलते ही पुराने दोस्त बन गए जैसे हमने खोए एक पुराने रिश्ते और एक देरीना रफाकत को दरियाफ्त कर लिया इनके लहजे का धीमापन गुफ्तु की गहराई शख्सियत में बला की संजीदगी और मतानत ने मुझे इनका गर्मीदा कर दिया और लंदन आते तो मुझे इनकी मेज़बानी और हम जलीसी का मौका मिलता वो अपने अंदाज बयान से सामने वाले को एहसास नहीं होने देते थे कि वो कितने बड़े आलम से मुखातिब हैं और से दूसरे की बात सुनते और नहाय शफकत से जवाब देते बयान हमेशा दिल नशीन रहता मेरे घर में क्याम करते तो ज़्यादा वक्त किताबों के साथ गुजारते ड्राइंग रूम में भी किताब इनके साथ होती मुझे महसूस होता जैसे वो किसी गहरी सोच में गर्क हैं खाना खाते तो नहाय बेतकल्लुफ़ी से खाने के दौरान अक्सर गुफ्तु करते रहते और मैं एक एक लम्हा महसूस होता रहता और उनके इलम से फैजयाब होता रहता मैंने इनके साथ नहाय यादगार वक्त गुजारा दो हज़ार सात में जब ये जामिया मिलिया के 
वाइस चांसलर थे तो उन्होंने मुझे तक, तीन तकलीफात में बुलाया नवंबर का महीना था तीनों कॉन्फ्रेंस एक के बाद एक चल रही थी पहली मौलाना रूम की 800 सौ साल बरसी थी उसके बाद औरंगजेब की वफात के 300 सौ साल गुजरने पर और आखिरी कॉन्फ्रेंस डेढ़ सौ साल पहले जंग आज़ादी के बारे में तीनों कॉन्फ्रेंसें भरपूर थी मुख्तलिफ मुल्कों के नामवर स्कॉलर आए हुए थे मुशीर साहब ने एक कार ड्राइवर के साथ मुझे दी और ठहरने को वाइस चांसलर स्वीट जो तीन कमरों पर मुश्तमिल थी एक कार और ड्राइवर मेरे दिल्ली के क्याम के आखिरी दिन तक मेरे साथ थे और मुझे हवाई अड्डे भी इसी ड्राइवर ने पहुँचाया जब मैं दिल्ली जाऊँ तो घर में दावत किया करते थे कम अज़ कम तीन तीस चालीस लोग बुलाए जाते घर इनका जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी में था जहाँ इनकी बेगम प्रोफेसर जोया हसन पढ़ाती थी दिल्ली के तमाम अहल इल्म वहाँ आया करते थे फिर वो मुझे लेकर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर भी जाया करते थे जामिया मिलिया से इन्हें तीन बरस के लिए ऑल इंडिया नेशनल आर्काइव का चीफ बना दिया गया जिसके जैली दफातर हर सूबे में मौजूद थे दिल्ली से बार बार इनका जाना बाहर जाना होता और वो फिर फोन पर उसका मुख्तर सा जिक्र मुझसे कर दिया करते थे नेशनल आर्काइव की मरकजी इमारत दिल्ली में है इस पुरशकों इमारत का उन्होंने पूरी तरह दौरा करवाया हमने कई तस्वीरें बनवाई दो दो तीन तीन हज़ार साल पुराने मैंने स्क्रिप्ट देखे कदीम हिंदी संस्कृत और बल्ती जबान की मौजीदा कागजों पर लिखी हुई तहरीरें कैसी महारत से रखी गई थी मैं 28 नवंबर 2014 को मुशीर साहब और उनकी बेगम के हमरा इंटरनेशनल सेंटर दिल्ली में था जहां मेरे साथ मेरे मुहबी एडवोकेट खलील और रहमान साहब भी थे कि एक फ़ोन आया जिसमें मुशी साहब को याद दिलाया गया कि अगले रोज़ इन्हें एक स्कूल का अफ्त में बात हरियाणा में करना है मुशी साहब मुझसे कहने लगे कि अगर आप फारिग हों तो मेरे साथ चलिए मैं राज़ी हो गया जोया कहने लगे कि अगर आप इनके साथ जा रहे हैं तो फिर मैं दिल्ली में अपने कई काम निपटा लूँगी आप लोग चले जाइए मैंने इसरार किया कि वो भी साथ चलें मगर यही तय हुआ कि वो नहीं जाएंगी और मुशीर साहब मुझे सुबह आठ बजे से पहले खलील के यहाँ से जहाँ मैं ठहरा हुआ था ले लेंगे मुशीर साहब वक्त मुकर पर खलील के यहाँ तशरीफ लाए और हम लोग मैं बात रवाना रवाना हो गए रास्ते में एक जगह रुक कर कॉफ़ी पी और गुफ्तु हिंदुस्तानी तारीख पर होती रही गौरी गजनबी अल्तमश लोधियों और मुगलों की बात चली मुशीर साहब ने वो वो नकात समझाए जो पूरी तारीख पढ़ने के बाद भी हमारी नज़र से महफ थे कोई 11 बजे सुबह हम मेहबाद पहुँचने वाले थे धूप निकली हुई थी झाड़ों की धूप मगर फिर भी इसमें तमाजत थी हम महवे गुफ्तु थे एक ज़ोरदार आवाज़ आई और मैंने देखा कि मुशीर साहब जो सामने की खाली सीट के पीछे बैठे हुए थे उछले और फिर सेक्रीन से जा टकराए सारे एयर बैग फट गए पीछे वाला ट्रक हमारी कार में घुस गया और आगे भी एक ट्रक होने की वजह से कार बिल्कुल पिचक गई ट्रक का बम्पर मेरी बाई लान में लगा मगर इस वक्त मुझे सिर्फ मुशी साहब की फिक्र थी छोटी सड़क थी सिर्फ मेरी तरफ का दरवाज़ा खुल सकता था फौरी तौर पर इन्हें इस तरफ से निकाला गया मुशी साहब इस वक्त चल सकते थे सड़क के दूसरी तरफ दो लोग चारपाई पर बैठे थे वो फ़ौर उठ कर मुशी साहब को बिठाया गया आवास वाख्ता होने के बावजूद मैंने अस्पताल का पूछा तो पता चला कि एक मील के फासले पर फर्स्ट एड सेंटर मौजूद है एक बड़ी गाड़ी वाले ने हमें वहाँ पहुँचाया मैंने मुशी साहब के फ़ोन से ही इनकी बेगम प्रोफेसर जोया हसन का नंबर लेकर इन्हें फ़ोन किया हालात बताए फर्स्ट एड वालों ने मुशी साहब के चेहरे और आँख पर जो जख्म आए थे इन्हें सीधिया और एक गाड़ी फ्राहम की जो नाम को एम्बुलेंस थी मगर सिर्फ स्ट्रेचर उसमें जा सकता था मैं पीछे मुशी साहब के साथ स्ट्रेचर के पास बैठ गया इनके चेहरे से रास्ता रिश्ता खून पूछता रहा गाड़ी तेज़ रफ्तारी से जा रही थी मगर धचके इस कदर लग रहे थे कि मुशी साहब स्ट्रेचर से उछले पड़ते थे वो कुछ देख नहीं पा रहे थे 
बार बार यही कहते हैं मेरी आंखों पर पट्टी क्यों बनी है हालांकि पट्टी तो क्या कोई बैंडेज तक नहीं लगा था खून बह चला जा रहा था और प्रेशर बैंडेज के बावजूद खून काफ़ी बह चुका था दो घंटे इस हादसे को हो चुके थे मुझे महसूस हुआ कि मेरी अपनी बाई रान कुछ भारी हो रही है देखा तो सोचन बहुत थी रंग बदल रहा था मगर फिर भी मैं खड़ा हो सकता था कोई पौने तीन घंटे लगे और हम दिल्ली के अपोलो अस्पताल में पहुंच गए वहाँ पर कोई पंद्रह बीस लोग बाहर खड़े हमारी गाड़ी का इंतज़ार कर रहे थे जोया मौजूद थी हमारे दोस्त खलील भी मौजूद थे फौरी तौर पर मुशी साहब को अस्पताल के स्ट्रेचर पर डालकर अंदर ले जाया गया जहाँ ऑपरेशन थिएटर तैयार था बस ये आखिरी साथ था मेरा और मुशी साहब का फिर मैंने इसके बाद उन्हें कभी नहीं देखा मुझे भी अस्पताल ले जाया गया मेरी राम का मुआयना किया गया और कहा गया कि अंदर कौन बह रहा है शरियान पड़ चुकी है इसे बंद करने के लिए सर्जरी करना पड़ेगी मैं इसके लिए तैयार नहीं था तीन रोज बाद मेरे वीजे की मायात खत्म हो रही थी और मुझे लाहौर पहुंचना था मैंने सर्जरी करवाने से इनकार कर दिया इस हादसे में हमारे साथ ड्राइवर भी था जो गाड़ी चला रहा था इसके माथे पर एक हल्की सी खराश थी और खून का एक कतरा भी नहीं टपका था खुदा मंदाला जिसे चाहे बचा दे मुझे बताया गया कि ऑपरेशन थिएटर में मुशी साहब को सात घंटे लगे चार जगहों से खोपड़ी टूटी थी मुशी साहब हफ्तों अस्पताल में रहे इन तीन दिन में टेलीविजन की खबरों और अखबार से मैंने अंदाज़ा लगाया कि मुशी साहब की कितनी कदर व मंजिलत आम लोगों में है लाहौर पहुँच कर जहाँ मेरी बीवी हसीना मौजूद थी मैंने सर्जन को दिखाया तो उस वक्त तक मेरी बाएँ रान दाएँ के मुकाबले में तीन गुना साइज की हो चुकी थी मगर खून रिश्ता बंद हो चुका था हम फौरी तौर पर लंदन वापस आ गए लंदन में मुकामी सर्जन को दिखाया इस वक्त तक हादसे को एक हफ्ता गुजर चुका था उसने डॉक्टर टेस्ट करके बताया कि खून अज खुद बंद हो चुका है और या तो आप इस वक्त का इंतज़ार करें कि खुद ही कुदरती तौर पर ठीक हो जाए या फिर इस राम को खुलवा लें और जमा हुआ खून खारिज करवा लें सर्जन ने खुद यही तजवीज़ दी कि लेट नेचर टेक सिक्स होम कोर्स मेरी और हसीना की राय भी यही ठहरी फिर भी हमने अपने अजीज दोस्त डॉक्टर एहसन जफर जैदी और डॉक्टर हिलाल फरीद को फ़ोन किया तो उनकी राय भी यही ठहरी कुदरती तौर पर सूजन ठीक होने में तीन महीने लगे हल्का सा दर्द में भी महसूस होता था फिर भी चलने फिरने में कोई दुशारी महसूस नहीं हुई और अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह बगैर किसी दिक्कत के मेरी सेहत ठीक हो गई लेकिन जहनी तौर पर सच पूछिए तो मैं आज भी उतना ही रंजीदा हूँ जितना हादसे के वक्त था पेशे के एतबार से मैं डॉक्टर हूँ सोचा कि किसी नफसियाती मालिद से रजू किया जाए शायद कोई इफाके की सूरत निकल आए तशीस हुई ट्रोमेटिक स्ट्रेस डिसऑर्डर यानी सदमे का नफसियाती असर तशीस किया गया इलाज के लिए मुझे एक खातून थेरापिस्ट के सपोर्ट कर दिया गया इसके पास हर हफ्ते एक डेढ़ घंटे के लिए जाना होता था ज़रा सा भी फ़ायदा नहीं हुआ पूरा साल ज़ाया हो गया अभी तक ड्राउन में ख्वाब आते हैं रातों को एक डेढ़ घंटे से ज़्यादा सो नहीं पाता इस हादसे के एक माह बाद मेरे अजीज दोस्त खलील मेरी खैरियत पूछने लंदन आए तो एक जुमला में गोया मुशीर साहब का तमाम हाल कह दिया बोले ऐसे आली दिमाग शख्स की बेदस्त पाई देखी नहीं गई इसके बाद हम दोनों घंटों खामोश रहे मुशीर साहब उन चंद लोगों में से थे जिन्हें मैं अपने लिए नमत शुमार करता हूँ इनके साथ एक ताल्लुक़ ख़ास था 
رفاقت دوستی اور مربت کی اعلیٰ اقدار انہی کے ساتھ رخصت ہو گئی دوستی اب گلے کا ہار نہیں تار ٹوٹا بکھر گئے دانے اللہ تعالیٰ سے دعا ہے کہ ان کی مغفرت فرمائے اور انہیں جنت کے اعلیٰ مقام پر فائز فرمائے آسمان تیری لہر پر شبنا مفشا نہیں کرے شکریہ
Franz Robinson, Dr. Fred Anashi, Professor Tihar Malik Sahab, our panelists, Mr. Vijay Rana, Mrs. Sundushi, Dr. Javed Sheikh Sahab, for sharing those moments, testing, and of course, Dr. Hilal Fariza. I think those person who deserve to should say anything is Hassan Bai, who was very close to me, here to him, and uh, he used to call him with uh, his uh, uh, house name Parvez, and his brother Umayyu Bai. I have seen him Umayyu Bai and uh, uh, Mushi Saab sitting, and with full UP languages of all abuses and everything you can hear and poetry. I want to say just this. From the first, this was very, we used to travel together and he always remembered this and says hi this. So I'm giving you, unlike uh, Dr. Fadara Sheikh, I don't have translation, but I hope you will like it. And then I will finish and invite Dr. Hassan Zaidi for the second one. Kab yaad mein tera saath nahi, kab haat mein tera haat nahi. It was so beautifully even. People don't know that he was very khush glue. Bahut achhi tarah se padte the, jab mood mein hote the. और कहते थे फिर से पढ़ो ऐसे शेर पढ़ो या ऐसे पढ़ो कहीं गलती होती कब याद में तेरा साथ नहीं कब हाथ में तेरा हाथ नहीं सद शुक्र की अपनी रातों में अब हिच की कोई रात नहीं मुश्किल है अगर हालात यहाँ ये यह बिल्कुल फिट होता है बस मुश्किल है अगर हालात यहाँ दिल दे जाए जा दे आए दिल वालों पूछे जाना में क्या ऐसे भी हालात नहीं जिस धस से कोई ये शेर को बहुत पसंद था कई बार पढ़ सकते जिस धस से कोई मक्तल में गया वो शान सलामत रहती है जिस धस से कोई मक्तल में गया वो शान सलामत रहती है ये जान तो आ जान आनी जानी है इस जान की कोई बात नहीं मैदान वफा दरबार में यहाँ नाम उन सब की पूछ कहा आशिक तो किसी का नाम नहीं कुछ इश्क किसी की जान नहीं गर बाजी इश्क की बाजी है जो चाह लगा दो दिल गर बाजी दिल की बाजी है जो चाह लगा दो दर किसका गर जीत गए तो क्या कहना हार बाजी मात नहीं इस कदम में बहुत सी रब वो पढ़ते थे हम याद करते हैं और सब सुनते हैं और सचमुच हम अभी तक कहते रहते हैं इस हमारी बात होती थी हमें पता नहीं किसकी नज़र लगी जो अल्लाह ने बोल अल्लाह उनको सब नसीब करे और हम दुआ करते हैं कि उनकी जो काम है और उनकी जो अच्छी चीज़ है वी विल टेक ओवर एंड थैंक यू टू ऑल स्पीकर Dr. Hassan Zaidi for the second part of the program. Thank you, Tom. Yes, uh, Mushir, we call him Parvez, was very close to us. We studied together. He was one year senior to me. He was with my brother who I used for daily. We spent a lot of time together. And uh, in his memory, I can only quote the share in my Sahel Hame Jano. Fritta hai falak parso. Tab khat ke parde se insani karte. 